It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Lester C. Hunt, United States Senator from Wyoming. Senator Hunt, about a year ago after the election of President Eisenhower, and at which time he received a an overwhelming majority in your home state of Wyoming. You said at that time that you felt he'd received a mandate from the people of your state and you felt under an obligation to support whatever policy he offered. A lot of things have happened since then. Do you st are you still an Eisenhower Democrat? Well, I must modify the statement you've just made by saying uh, that uh, within the limit uh, of my conscience, I would support the president. And uh, up to date, I have found uh, no reason to change that position. Well, you're sleeping well at night then. Well, tell me, as a member of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Hunt, uh, how do you feel about this presidential directive to reduce our forces in Korea by two divisions? Do you think that <coughs> may be endangering our position there? I believe this, that there should be no man in the United States today better qualified uh, to know whether or not that is the proper thing to do to remove two divisions from Korea than the President of the United States. However, you must understand that he's not <coughs> isn't acting entirely uh, within his own knowledge. He has the advice of professionally trained chiefs of staff, all good men. He no doubt has uh, received uh, uh, from the uh, commanding general in Korea the advice that that is a safe thing to do. And you must remember, too, that he has said that this withdrawal will be very gradual. He, it will take, I believe he said, two years probably before it's completed. Well, uh, Senator, how do you feel about the... Uh the idea behind our new military policy, that is to say, the idea of a mobile reserve, which will allow us, generally speaking, to lessen our ground strength and depend more on our air power. <clears throat> well, I think uh, this is the air atomic age. And uh, what we're doing, I believe, uh, uh, the Armed Services Committee is in uh, agreement with it. Uh, it's, it's proper at this time to concentrate on air power and uh, to cut down on the a number of foot soldiers. Um, I see uh, no reason at all to disagree with the uh, present uh, program. Well, Senator, I'd like to turn to the domestic situation, if I may. Uh, now, take the, your situation out in Wyoming. Aren't your uh, stockmen out there screaming over the fall in cattle prices? Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't exactly say they're screaming, but they're hurt and they're discouraged. And in order to uh, get uh, the same amount of income in 53 that they did in the fall of 54, they have had to ship twice as many cattle for the price is about half what it was. Yes, they are discouraged. <coughs> we are, uh, of course, uh, hopeful that uh, the price of cattle will come back uh, some. We shipped, as I say, uh, twice as many, and that's practically true throughout the United States. We had a tremendous overpopulation of cattle. We had 93 million. Now, the average in the United States runs someplace around 70 million in a normal year. Well, Senator Hunt, if you're a cattleman out in Wyoming or suffering from a shortage of folding money, how is it that we people here in the city are paying through the nose, as it were, when we order a good steak? <clears throat> well, it's because of the tremendous uh, increase in the cost of every step uh, of a 700-pound steer from a ranch uh, in my county in Wyoming <clears throat> to my table in Washington, D.C. Uh, when you trace that animal from the time he leaves that ranch until uh, I utilize it on my table, there are so many different agencies get into the act. It is handled so many times. And uh, transportation rates, as an example, have increased 11 times uh, since the end of World War II. It's just a tremendous increase in the cost of everything along the line. And a recent study that I have made myself uh, proves to me that there is no particular uh, area uh, in the meat processing uh, work that is getting an unconscionable profit. Oh. Senator, we've had a number of Democrats in this program, like uh, Mike Monroney from a neighboring state, 
And they have complained about what they call the administration's giveaway policy, and they refer to what they call the giving away of power of Thailand's oil, and so on. Now, you've got a lot of federal land, as I recall, out in Wyoming. And do you go along with this policy of uh, <coughs> giving away these resources to uh, private industry and private ownership? No, I don't go along with it at all. I think the administration's making a great mistake in giving up the last very wonderful potential dam site, uh, Hell's Canyon Dam site, uh, on the line between Idaho and uh, Oregon, uh, and allowing uh, private power to go in and build three smaller dams. Uh, regardless of uh, Grand Coulee and Bonneville, we have in that western area now something uh, like a 17% uh, deficit in electric energy. I don't go along at all with uh, giving away that dam site. Uh, however, you mentioned the tide lands, and uh, I don't consider that uh, the action of the Congress was giving away anything. You must remember that that area we have considered state property for 171 years, and I could go into great detail to tell you about the management of those tide lands by mm -hmm. the states and the various uh, laws that they have passed with reference to fishing, with reference to cropping sponges, uh, with reference to uh, mining sulfur. Uh, the states have even made international fishing agreements uh, with Mexico. Uh, I don't consider the Tidelands a giveaway at all. Senator, with Congress opening the day after tomorrow, uh, many people are predicting a very hectic session in an election year with bipartisan cooperation very difficult. <coughs> Do you concur in that forecast? I don't exactly. Uh, we all thought because of the uh, fact that we were so evenly divided that the first session of the 81st Congress would be hectic. It wasn't. It proved to be the most peaceful uh, session uh, of uh, Congress, I think, almost in our history. Uh, you boys uh, know as well as I do that on several occasions uh, the Democrats stepped right out and bailed the President out. In fact, on 36 critical votes in the Senate, uh, in which the president's prestige was on the line, so to speak. Uh, he won in 31. He only lost five. And of those 31, he needed and he got substantial help uh, in 23 of the votes uh, from Democrats. Now, our leadership, both the majority and the minority, uh, is of a disposition uh, not uh, to make this a hectic political session. And uh, another thing I'd like to call your attention to is the President's relationship with the Congress. Hasn't it been noticeable to you gentlemen that as yet the President has on no occasion criticized the Congress, even when we said no emphatically to him with reference to raising the debt limit, uh, the President uh, did not in uh, any degree at any time in any way criticize us. The president, let me say, is uh, getting along very, very well with the Congress. Well, Senator, th there seems to be a slight split in the, uh, between Congress and the president in the case of uh, the right wing of the Republican Party, and I refer to Senator McCarthy and the president over this issue of communists in the government. Now, do you feel that uh, this is going to be the big issue again in the coming uh, November elections? <coughs> No, I don't. I think the people are going, and are perhaps now, getting a little tired of uh, dragging across the front pages of the paper the names of uh, those supposedly uh, communists in our government who have been dead for several years. Uh, most of them had gone uh, through uh, hearings of the Un-American Activities Committee uh, in the House and Dexter White, uh, as you know, appeared before uh, certain of your law bodies here in New York, and uh, nothing was found uh, uh, sufficient to indict him. I don't think that communism is going to be much of an issue in the next election. I've been in actively in public life for 22 years, and to the best of my knowledge, I never met a communist. I know you've been in public life, Senator Hunt. seems to me that uh, you're practically the only dentist who has ever been a governor of a state and as a uh, member of that profession in, in the Senate now, can you tell me how you feel about the different approaches to uh, a national health program? Well, I feel that uh, our national health program uh, should be primarily uh, that uh, which is instigated and uh, carried on by the uh, Public Health Service of the United States. I feel we should encourage in every possible way 
uh, prepaid health insurance uh, by private insurance companies. Uh, I am opposed uh, to socialized medicine, for from my own profession and from a study of socialized medicine and dentistry in England, I am forced to the conclusion that when you take competition, when you take the incentive out of the practice of medicine and dentistry, uh, when you put, uh, so to speak, a physician or a dentist uh, just as a civil service worker by the clock, you lose that competition, he loses his interest, and the professions will, uh, in their efficiency, lower their standards. Senator, I'd like to uh, put this other question to you as a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, looking ahead to the coming year. We're in a period of military retrenchment, and this is going to be a year of decision as far as the European Army goes. We may get it, we may not. What is our military posture in Europe going to be if we do not get the European Army, which we've been trying to? <coughs> well, uh, Mr. Burdett, that's sort of an iffy question and uh, a little hard to answer. I happen to uh, be one who feels uh, we've made tremendous progress along that line in NATO. I am convinced uh, in uh, Europe uh, there is in the stream of public opinion a very strong undercurrent uh, both in the government and in the military of the various countries uh, to form a united Europe just as we have a United States. I am inclined uh, to feel that uh, although on the surface we do see these things happen like uh, the result of the election in Italy, uh, like some comments in Parliament, uh, the French government, which must be reorganized, we can't have a revol we can't have this reorganization of their government every 30 days. But nevertheless, down there's a deep-seated <coughs> feeling on the part of Europe that they want to form a united Europe, and I believe we are on the way if we have patience. That's well, thank all you very much, Senator Hudson. A great pleasure to have you here tonight. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was. Larry Lesser and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Lester C. Hunt, United States Senator from Wyoming. <coughs> Watchmakers of the old school, such as Longines, pride of workmanship is evident in every detail of every operation. In a watch, in truth, the smallest cog is just as important as the biggest wheel. Pride of workmanship made Longines the world's most honored watch. Honored at world's fairs by 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Honored at government observatories with countless prizes and citations for accuracy. Honored as official watch by sports and contest associations the world over. Now for all who have an appreciation of the fine and the beautiful, the pride of workmanship so evident in every Longines watch makes an irresistible appeal. Our particular message at this time is an important one. If you wish to buy and own or proudly give just about the finest watch made anywhere in all the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch, priced as low as $70,150. And regardless of the price you pay for your watch, it's made with that pride of workmanship that's made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, agency for Longines Whitnor watches. This is the CBS Television Network.